afternoon, folks. It's just after 1 p.m. on Monday, September 12th. Uh, therefore, I will call to order the Affordable Housing Trust meeting uh, for today. I'm uh, Chair Joe Powers. To my left. He's still Don Howell. Thank you. To my right. Uh, still Larry Brophy and uh, my esteemed colleague here, Brendan Lowney, to my, to my right. Brendan Lowney. Thank you. But you didn't um, identify. Member Judith Underwood is uh, unavailable in person. Uh, we may be able to try her again on her phone, but in the meantime, uh, we have a quorum. It being 102, we'll get the meeting underway. Uh, the first item on the agenda is old business. Uh, we are joined this, uh, this afternoon uh, by our conservation agent, Amy Yusowski. Uh Amy and I met uh, recently to uh, discuss the conservation review of the boundary and topog topographic survey that was presented at the trust meeting uh, last by uh, Coastal Engineering, and this is specifically related to Assessor's Map 61, parcels B1-A and B1-B. Uh, Amy, if you don't mind coming forward and joining us. Um, if anybody wants paper copies to follow along with, I have a couple. I don't. I can make more. I got it right here, so we've got one right here. Yeah, we'll, we'll share this one. Let's see. Thanks for doing this, by the way. Not a problem. <clears throat> Okay, so, oh. forget, I'm on this side of the table now, I'm never on this side. <laughs> uh, for the record, Amy Sowski, Conservation Administrator. Um, the town had a site plan completed for, for these two parcels of land, which are adjacent to the entrance of Cranberry Valley Golf Course. And the uh, purpose of that is there were wetlands that we knew of on the property. We had no site plan of the property. Before, before we go too deep in this, sure. site plan means something. We don't have a site plan. We have boundaries that we've established uh, after a survey. Site plan would mean that we have building. No, no. Well, no, to, to this conservation, this, yeah, this yeah. Is it isn't plan. an accepted site plan with the planning department. Well, but we do have boundaries, and that's what we're looking at. Well, in conservation terms, we do we call this, this site, site plan because it shows what's existing out on the site. To I'm just saying it for the audience. Yeah. Um, so as far as like site plan review, no, we have, we're not at that point yet. This I just want really to make sure that everybody out there knew that we're not building something yeah. tomorrow. Yep. So this really shows the topography. It shows the bounds. It shows where the wetlands are. Um, I did take a look at the wetland data sheets that were have been provided um, to verify that. I am pretty familiar with the property. Um, this property, the wetlands are outlined in, can I bring this closer to me? Sure, absolutely. So I don't have to kind of go back and forth. Can you see? You want to use this? Because I can actually see it from there. So the wetland is outlined in green. And they're, according to the Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program, they're not just wetlands, there are vernal pools. The vernal pool might be all of or only part of the wetland, only sections, sometimes only sections of wetlands are actually vernal, meaning seasonal wetlands, only present during um, the spring months. So what they also did is they put in the Conservation Department uh, Commission's 50-foot no disturb zone in the red so also for your reference, there's a wetland across the street, which is the bog, um, the uh, Gingras bog, but it is a regulatable wetland. There's a wetland on the south side, and there's a wetland that is the retention pond um, of, Cranber of the golf course, and then the main wetland in the middle here. So you have red lines kind of crisscrossing, a 50-foot no disturb zone. Um, the Conservation Commission will rarely um, grant any type of variance for work in the 50-foot no disturb zone, maybe a little pruning, maybe some invasive removal, um, maybe a path, but nothing major, certainly no structures um, and no clearing. Um, the blue lines that you see are the 100-foot buffer zone, which is the edge of the Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> as you can see on the southernmost lot, um, the only area outside the, outside the 100 foot buffer is right here. 
Um, of note, not my regulation, but Board of Health regulation, no leaching component of a septic system on a vacant or undeveloped lot can be within 100 feet of a wetland. And, and Amy, just for the benefit of anyone listening or watching, yep. you're talking parcel B1-B, is that correct? Correct. Well, it says, it doesn't say on here. It just says lot A and lot B, but it's B. It's, yeah, it's all right, so that's yeah, B, yeah, so B1-B. Dash dash B. And you're talking about uh, an easterly um, segment. There's Thank you. There's a tiny little portion outside of uh, conservation and health jurisdiction in the eastern yep. part. The majority is not. Um, this northern section, or lot A, for people listening, there's a little bit more area of upland, I would say. You have outside the 100 foot buffer zone up here on the northwest section of the lot is outside the 100 foot buffer. You also have this kind of high and dry area in the northeast section of the lot, but it's hard to get there. You can't cross the wetland to get there. <laughs> so with this, um, this would, this is a first step for anybody wanting to do anything on the lot looks at the lot's worth, um, the possibilities of what these lots could be for. Um, you'd have to do a plan like this. Um, so that's, it has not gone in front of conservation yet. There wouldn't, the town would have to put that forward if you wanted to do anything on the property. But I'm just here to kind of explain the plan that the town had done and answer any questions that you might have. So before I open up to this house, first of all, thank you, Amy. Um, it was very helpful for me for our discussion last week. Um, as you know, I rely upon you to be one of my translators, and I think you did an excellent job of that. Uh, and for the benefit of the trust and everyone here, what I had asked Amy was, so the trust uh, is the, uh, the rightful owner of these parcels after a transfer that was conducted uh, three years ago at town meeting. And really what the trust is trying to, de to derive from this is what, if anything, can be done with this property uh, because for my purposes, we want to know what is the value or what value lies within that um, because the trust would need to know if there's value uh, to take any next steps. So with that, I'll open it up for the trust for any questions or comments uh, directly to our conservation agent and go from there. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> Let's say, because we haven't actually, we've left it as, as it is. This is exactly how it yep. arrived to us. And it's specified as two lots, but I mean, we could expunge the lot line. Uh, my question is, in the aggregate, given the periphery that you've identified and everything, is there sufficient uh, property if the two lots were joined to be able to put even one residence on it? I, that's... And I know it's just a preliminary I, yeah, I gotcha I kind of question. It, everything has to, you know, you can't say something is developable or not unless we see actual application, but I don't know if I would see the benefit. Um, I don't know if it would allow more or allow, versus if you had two of these versus one, I don't know if you'd be allowed any more if you would have the combined, because this lot is very, this lot would be very difficult to, the southern lot, lot B, would be very difficult to do any, to develop. Um, whether it could be used for something else, easements, Joe and I spoke about that a little bit, and um, maybe, but by combining, whether you have one or both, your potential buildable area or area for septic whether it's one or two lots, it's still going to be up here or over here. And up here, in my professional opinion, it would be hard to do anything here because you'd have to build a bridge. Build a bridge or fill it or do, like, if you were to put, try to put your septic here, you'd have to m go underground. Um, so, really, this up here, and here's the fit. So, the 50 foot is the absolute no touch, right? No. So, it's not from the blue line up from here up is really kind of what your development area is. But the septic has to sit in the blue. 
the septic has to sit in the See, fluid. See, that, that's the trick. The septic has to sit in the fluid, and then you also have to have a reserve area. Yeah. So <laughs> if you're leaching fields, you have to have that space equal for the reserve. So it gets really tight. I get it, and that's why I was asking whether this could even be done without a variance of some sort. Uh, and you can't get a variance for the septic. You can only get it for site coverage. You, yeah. you cannot, yeah, the Board of Health will not grant a variance. Yeah. Um, the only other potential option, and I don't want to speak for the Conservation Commission, um, if you were to build a small residence or something up in this area between the 50 to 100 foot buffer, that's uh, the, the northwest uh, quadrant of the property, correct? Right, northwest of Lot A. Mitigation could be putting a conservation restriction on Lot B. But if Lot B is really very hard to develop, Just is that it. is that worth, would the commission say, well, it can't be developed anyway, so right. does it, is that mitigation at all? Don, any more questions or comments? Oh, that answers <laughs> everything. It, Larry? It, it looks to me like if I were the developer, um, I think I'd be improving the arrival experience for the golf course. <laughs> Out of that, you're going to build a little garden at the top. Mm -hmm. There's really not much room for anything. Yeah. I mean, you could plant a row of trees and call it whatever you want to call it for the arrival experience, but I don't see that there's going to be any development at all on that property, not in the long term. Even with the regular setbacks. I mean, Brendan, was that a comment or a question? I'm sorry, even with the even with the That's a comment, standards. right? Yes. Yeah, right. I mean, if there was a sewer that came by, I suppose there's a possibility, but right. that that's a pretty minuscule um, parcel of land in the northwest cor corner. Yeah. yeah. So once you take in that 25 foot from the front and then 20 foot from sides, it's really tough. It'd be the smallest house you've ever seen. I mean, there may be, I don't know if there's going to be other opportunities for other value. It is in a zone two uh, water recharge area, these lots. So could yeah. there be nitrogen well, credits? That, that would be that my would be question for you. If you could expand on that, please. Because again, sure. for me, for the trust's purposes, what we need to de determine is for the properties that we possess, what what is there for value, if any? Yep. And so you did raise the potential opportunity of some sort of credits, I'll let you speak to it better than I could. Um, I, I will defer to my colleague, Katie O'Neill of the Health Department, but I'll just tell you what she told me and you can follow up with her if you want. So being in a zone two water recharge area, you're, the town well field is pretty close, just north of Cranberry Valley um, Golf Course. This is an area of contribution. So these lots are limited if you were to be able to develop on them, um, one bedroom per 10,000 square feet. So these lots cumulatively, and I don't know if it's um, upland or wetland for, for, that would be a health question for Katie. You have between 101,000 and 126,000 square feet here. So could these lands be, could there be easements granted for people who might want another bedroom um, where they normally couldn't have one if they were in a zone two they have a 30,000 square foot lot, they have three bedrooms. Could they purchase an easement here to offset? That is outside of my realm, it's just something that has come up in discussion with staff. Um, and Katie, our health director, would be the person to talk about that, the value of that. Okay. Thank you, Amy. Any other comments or questions from uh, trust members? Can you put septic in the standard 25 foot setback, like in the, in the frontage? Again, it would be Katie, I believe you can up to 10 feet away. 10 feet away. But, I, but ask our health director. Yeah. Okay. That's the option. So I don't think so. Yeah. Mr. Howell? Being mindful that we're being recorded and that people watch these things. Mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, the only comment I'm going to make is, given where the state is going, uh, with sewering, I mean, I mean, given where we are, I mean, forget about the the eight phases. I mean, this would be like phase 12. There's absolutely no density there that would uh, be remediated by sewering that particular area. Uh, on Oak, Oak Street just doesn't have that kind of 
<laughs> you know, that kind of bedroom density. I mean, unless you were talking about remediating runoff from the golf course, which we haven't even gotten to as, a, as an issue yet. So, I mean, it's highly unlikely you were talking about anything but a Title V. Um, yeah, right. I mean, they have to, you have to meet the state code first. And that shortly could become an AI. IA? Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. I just learned <laughs> IA. Don't, okay. don't trip me up. But it, it, it would... An innovative alternative, correct? Yeah. yeah. Alternative technology, yes. It's the same thing. But the point is, is that that's the direction they're going in. It would make it more onerous, not less, to do anything here. Thank I, you, Amy. Nice I, to get a gift like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, given, obviously, the keen interest of the, the, the public, you're not done yet, but yeah. I would open it up if there's any questions from anyone in the audience uh, or even comments. And if you do, just come to the... Um, center podium and then introduce yourself and offer your comments or questions. All right. Thanks, Amy. Appreciate the uh, the input. Thank you, Amy. You're welcome. Oh, Amy, hang on. You almost made it. <laughs> uh, Janet, if you can just introduce yourself at the center podium, a, right right back there. Oh, I'll switch. Okay. okay. Thank you. Janet Cardello with Adult Shared Living of Howard. Good afternoon, Janet. Thank you. I'm just um, remembering last time when the engineer was here, I thought he said there could be two three-bedroom residences on there. Did, did, I mean. Mr. Howell, if you want. Yeah, I believe, because I was here too, uh, I believe that he was talking relative to the upland available, but Amy's not talking about that. She's, t she's talking about once you delete setbacks that are required for conservation purposes, then you're, you reduce even further. It's not just all upland so you can do anything you want or right up until the edge of the conservation areas, There's, there are setbacks. And Janet, if I could just add, I think um, building off of the engineer's uh, work and presentation last time, that's why the trust directed me to have the conversation with our conservation agent. And for my purposes, based on what we've heard today, um, and I'd rather rely upon trust directive, but my inclination would be for me to reach out uh, to our health director to see from the trust standpoint if there is uh, any other impacts. I, I think Amy's covered it well, but really what is the town looking at through the trust with that property? And it may be that the only value that we see there are those easements regarding the zone two, zone two recharge area. So we're still in the, in the middle of our process of evaluating what this property is and what we can use it for. Okay, and we're still showing up. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, thank we wouldn't you. expect anything less. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Anyone else before we uh, let our conservation agent go back to her other job, rail job? All right. Thanks again, Amy. Thank you, Amy, I appreciate Thanks it. Thanks a lot, Amy. And so is that the sense of the trust that I'll reach out next to our health director and continue sure. the discussions regarding these uh, parcels? Yep. All right. So then next item on the agenda, new business, is we have uh, 15 sets of uh, meeting minutes to potentially approve. I admit I've only gotten through half of them. So you guys, if you have, then you can make a motion. Do I hear any motions regarding the minutes from uh, spanning from June 18 of 2020 to April 25, 2022, inclusive with a number of dates in 21 and 22? I, I would move, Mr. Chairman, that we approve the minutes as published from June 18, 2020 till April 25th, 2022. I'll second. Thank you, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Trust ready for the vote. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? I'll abstain. Thank so you. three, zero, one. Ready. Thank you, yep. Uh, And now we have uh, John Carey to join us. John, if you want to come right up uh, to the center table. And uh, John uh, Carey, as you may know, is uh, the current owner, or the new owner, perhaps to say more accurately, of Five Bells Neck, uh, AKA the West Howard Schoolhouse. Uh, and um, I know I sent to trust members, uh, we do have a copy of the seven pages of schematics uh, that John's offered, but. Uh, John had reached out to uh, 
engage in a conversation with us, which I think is very timely, um, on potential next steps regarding that property as it relates to housing options. And I have to understand, John, you've also had conversation with at least the Historic District Historical Commission, is that correct? Uh, when I was purchasing it, um, they were originally going to put me under their um, supervision, and we had a discussion, and it didn't go far in terms of what they were looking for, but I have spoken to people about, um, at least in the historic um, district, um, Duncan and those people, about what they might be looking for. Um, and it's all just very early, so m my goal is to you know, kind of talk to all the different committees and organizations and groups and try to get a um, synopsis of what people are looking for with this project and hopefully I can design something that uh, appeases as many as I can. Excellent. That's now, so with that, I've told the trust that we have a hard copy here. It's been shared with the members and for the benefit of those in the public. You've sent us a, uh, in my opinion, comprehensive seven-page schematic. Um, I'll let you do the talking based on that, but you've got some great numbers uh, potentially that are in, the, in that presentation. Yeah, so it's, it's certainly an early set. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to put together something for talking purposes. Um, I've done some basic pricing. I've had some other projects I'm working on on Cape Cod, so this is just kind of coming about. I know I bought it a few months ago. Um, and basically I tried to put together um, what I thought would be the best solution for um, the site from a housing standpoint, a historic standpoint. Uh, I really try not to alter it any more than I needed to. Um, and then also, um, try to help, um, I think, probably the biggest housing um, shortfall right now is, is kind of the one bedroom stuff. I have a couple rental properties in Harwich and other parts of Massachusetts. And if I put a, especially in Harwich, if I put a listing up um, on you know Craigslist or any of those marketplaces, I get 50 emails a week of just people, you know, that I, I, you know, I'm a contractor, so people like myself that you know, they live alone, they don't have a big family, and they just need a place to live that they can be proud of. So in terms of density, seven one bedrooms um, would help out a lot of you know, people in Harwich. And so I think it's a, it's a good solution for this, this property. You know, the thinking is you know, seven people now have homes. Um, and it's a building that's you know, obviously not doing much right now. Um, I'm happy to talk about you know, the, the elevations, the plans, whatever you guys might be interested in. Um, and I know I kind of just got it to you late. I, uh, you know, I'm just kind of getting around to this project, so. Well, the uh, good news for what it's worth is we've met our specificity of notice requirement for the Attorney General, meaning we're having a discussion. Okay. So the trust is not contemplating taking any actions. Rather, I think this is, can be the first of uh, any number of conversations, but um, you've given us enough to at least start talking to you about it. Okay. Um, and, and I haven't done a lot of this small town stuff, so. Anything I may be going on a tangent on, just stop me if it's inappropriate for public. I think there are more than enough people to my left and right that will certainly do okay. that if need be. Um, with that, I'll open it up to the trust first for any questions or comments to John. And for those in the, in the public, we do have a hard copy, so we'll circulate that in a moment uh, for folks to look at. But um, Larry? I have a question, John. <clears throat> I mean, you hear from various people probably throughout the Commonwealth and more specifically in town here, and the one-bedroom units are going to certainly fill a specific need. What other sizes do you see as something that's really in demand? I mean, a one-bedroom, that, that's a certain group of people, but surely there's some families that are looking pretty hard, too. Yeah, I'm sure any size group is in demand, um, but in terms of you know, solving um, the most Providing the most units at a, a cost basis that that works, um, you know, building like this this could probably do two three bedrooms, um, but from a, an investment standpoint, um, the cost of building is just too high. So by having the multiple units, you know, at the end of the day, whoever's taking this risk to build something like this, um, you have to um, how do I want to say this? Uh, you got to kind of set yourself self, self up for. Um, the, success or the best chance of it. Um, so, you know, it's so expensive to build this stuff nowadays that building small one bedrooms is um, a challenge that you can kind of take on. The bigger stuff is, is just you know, too involved, too many people, um, and it scares too many, you know, 
neighbors and stuff. So if, if I come in and say, you know, I want to build seven three bedrooms, the project's never gonna happen. You know, drive people, um, you know, terrify people. So the, the, the one bedrooms are somewhat affordable to build. They can be small and, and, and um, the cost for the renter is also minimum because if you build these bigger things, just heating alone is a $500 a month bill. So it just, it just adds up quick. So, you know, at this point in my career, I'm more comfortable taking on smaller size rental units than being able to, you know, build a 2,000 square foot rental unit. So for me, that's just kind of the direction I'm trying to drive my career in. Okay, having said that, um, I, I certainly understand what you're saying. Um, <clears throat> if there were, let's, let's hypothetically say that you had a development of, of, of 30 units or something like that, and you put in a handful of one bedrooms because they're certainly easy to sell and, and necessary. Um, but the two bedrooms for people that have a child or two or the three bedrooms for people that have, you know, a bigger family, there wouldn't be any difficulty from your point of view um, in marketing those, would there? No, no. I have two two bedrooms and um, it's crazy, the demand if you put up an ad for them. So you have no problem renting anything. Um, it's just about density and, you know, if I do seven two bedrooms, then we're looking at two to three people per and, and just the capacity of the building alone would just be overwhelmed. You know, this, this is a school or was a school, we used to have 50 people a day. Um, you know, my, my look, my goal would be, you know, one to two people in these one bedroom units, you know, maybe a couple, but probably a lot of single people. And will they have some kids go find another place? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's, yeah. it's addressing the, what's manageable at this point. You know, I, the project doesn't make sense fiscally to build two units, it just doesn't. <laughs> so I have to do what makes sense for me. And, you know, I love a bigger lot. If you guys have any bigger lots, but this is pretty small and I know people don't want the building changing much and uh, I, I would guess at this phase they don't want me adding other buildings on this lot so I'm taking what I was sold and trying to do what you know, helps most people. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Don? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I've been trying to follow you as you slog your way through the alphabet soup of government uh, in town. Uh, in uh, since I don't think everybody necessarily looking even at our packet would have the, the full picture. I mean, you made some comments. Uh, you're right about the foundation. I, Alan Thompson and I went down under that at about 1997, I think it was, when we were hoping to salvage the building or move it or something. Uh, it, it has to be lifted. It has to be set on some sort of real foundation. Mm -hmm. So that that's true. Uh, in terms of affordability, I gathered that you were kind of reticent to getting uh, locked in uh, to the formula with the state, but I, and I'll also say that most of the money that we have that we could help anybody with comes from the CPC, and we're limited by law uh, on that to 80% of area median income, so, and that's rigid. Uh, the other money, I think we can go up to 125% uh, with, so, that's that's a possibility in the future because I, I think you'll find that everybody here is really eager to see you succeed in this. Uh, if even if it's not uh, affordable housing with a capital A, the workforce housing has no legal definition really. Uh, they're about 20 years behind the times. They really need to have a, a second look at that because we know that a lot of people are trying to adjust the 60 and 80 percent median income people. But then there's this big carve out in the middle and until you get to be upper middle class after that, there's nothing, I'm sure you know that, there's nothing for anybody to rent. Uh, so I'm, I'm personally a big fan of what you're trying to do. If we could help you out in some way, even if it's a bully pulpit, that would be, you're not gonna find us resisting you trying to develop it in the way that you're talking about. Good, well, I appreciate that. Um, my, my first thing is, is get a project that looks good for, like I said, as many people as possible, and then um, I start meeting with the different committees and boards and stuff in Harwich, and see how viable it is. You know, I think it is viable. I think I have the path through site plan review and stuff, but uh, as I've learned with all these projects, there's always somebody that's able to stop you. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. And then if, if we get to that far, yeah, I'd like to create a project that's viable on its own and that I don't need um, any handouts or anything, but. 
Um, I'll, I would love to talk to anyone that would have any ideas for p assistance financing because it is crazy expensive. And it's a, it's a million dollars just to renovate with, you know, because we have to lift the school up. Well, on site coverage, you're not really looking for a big ask. No. I mean, you have that asphalt area uh, where they had the hoops, uh, but uh, that was used for parking. I mean, it was an active school uh, at one point in its history. So, and it was a, uh, a teen center. Uh, for Wrecking Youth, uh, where they had parking, parking. So, I mean, you're not going to be asking for an exception of some sort uh, to get to there. So it really boils down. So if people get upset about it, it's an existing use that you're trying to put to a better use right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've I, spoken to most of the neighbors in all directions, and I don't think anyone's going to have much issue with what we're looking to do. Um, so I, I don't know where the resistance will come, but I'm sure it will come somewhere. <laughs> If you're looking for monetary assistance, again, we have some funds that aren't encumbered the way the uh, community preservation money is. That can go up in, in your terms. It's whatever the mean income is uh, in this area, if it's $80,000, $60,000, we can go up to 125% of that and still yeah. qualify what we're doing as fitting in that bucket. Uh, so uh, you would have to understand that too. You have to take a look at what the demographics are, and whether that's the target audience that you were looking for for one or more of the units. Yeah, I mean that's kind of the exact range that I'm looking to service here. It's, it's people that I grew up and are friends with, and there's nowhere for them to live, or people that have been Harwich. Yeah, you know, I spent the last. I'm 33. I think I spent the last 25 years coming down here, and I have so many friends and associates and people that live down here. There's nowhere to live. They all live, move to Plymouth and stuff. And it drives me nuts because I moved here because I love it. So it's like I, I, if I can do one thing, it'd be nice to start building something that you know people would be proud to live in. That's kind of my thinking with this project and hopefully more. But we'll, we'll see. I personally wish you great success because that if it's something if, we if need. If there's anything we can do to help, just ask us. Absolutely. Yeah, my thing is you know try to you know get feed, feedback from everyone and then um, you know start meeting the committees hopefully this week, next week, and um, see where the resistance is and see what the needs are. And then once we have that, you know, if I can get seven units, it looks like a decent project. If they cut me back to three, it's just not going to happen because the cost to lift it, unfortunately, is uh, to lift the buildings 50 grand and then to put a new foundations 50 grand. So you're at 100 grand there before you've done anything. So it's like it's just the stuff adds up so quickly. So we'll see. But I appreciate the support, and I'll, I'll come back to you as soon as I know more about the viability of the project. That's and, great. And I think you're, you're at the front end of several developments that are in the, in the, in, in the beginning stages of happening here. And although I'm not exactly sure how the town um, <coughs> goes, goes through the process of approving it committee by committee, I suspect that you probably have one group of people where it's one-stop shopping. You go in and- So we have our community development fun. team. Yeah. Uh, it's an informal conversation. Uh, here at Town Hall, it's um, usually the department heads of the various regulatory bodies. So as somebody's contemplating something, they avail themselves, come in, have a conversation. It's not before a public body. It's not before an audience. Mm. It's to, you know, evaluate concepts and find out what next steps would be. Is that, I think that's what you're referring to. That, yeah, that, I think that's something I suggest to you. If you have something that comes up, you don't want to go through it a month and a half process of getting a meeting and going to just come in and talk to the group of a group of people some people might not might not make any difference to others can solve your problem right there yeah and, and that's a group that meets regularly or correct yeah you would uh, contact the assistant town administrator Megan Eldridge okay uh, tell her that you'd like to get in front of the community development team and then she'll have a conversation with you about you know the appropriate attendees but Typically, it's uh, health, conservation, planning, building. Yep. Um, in this instance, we might include the cemetery director simply because of the proximity to that property. Um, but that's the core group, and it's really a, an opportunity for you to pick their brains. Yeah, well, that's kind of the exact list that I was going to start reaching out to this week, so that would probably be a good, good starting point. Quick, easy, and cheap, and you can do it yourself. <laughs> I like that. Brendan, <laughs> did you have any comments or no, questions? I'm, I'm fine. I, I like that you're staying on the original footprint. Um, yeah. I'm also on the historic commission, so that's I remember. We're excited <laughs> about that. I remember. So, um, no, it looks great. And if uh, you can get the seven units, that'd be fantastic. But please definitely come back. 
I will. I'll keep you guys posted. And so, if anyone has questions. So good news is we're not done yet. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions myself, but I think it's going to be helpful for everybody, including those in assembled here. Um, I just want to read for the record what you've presented to us as the schematic. <coughs> These documents will be added to our packet, which gets posted on our website. Um, but Mr. Carey has presented the town with a seven-page document. Uh, the first page uh, indicates five Bells Neck Road multifamily, uh, talking about occupancy, parking load, project scope. Um, and what you see is a very well-crafted, in my opinion, uh, use for five Bells Neck. And within it, um, I'll just read from the document. The use is group R2. Uh, that my understanding is that be residential, uh, moderate, which would be two family, or excuse me, multifamily. multifamily. Thank Correct, you. Yeah. Uh, in the basement area, he's looking to utilize 1,280 square feet. Same square footage for the first floor, second floor, third floor. So the total floor area uh, for that property, uh, for that building is 5,120 square feet. Talking about two spaces per unit, uh, which is the required load, which would be 14 spaces. He's identified in his schematics 19 parking spaces. Again, the project scope is to build seven year-round one-bedroom apartments inside the existing schoolhouse structure uh, with the replacement of the existing foundation. Uh, the schematic on pages uh, two and three show uh, the potential facade of the building, including um, a uh, solar photovoltaic array, correct? Yep, 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 try to offset some of the energy costs of the building. And then in the uh, remaining pages, in the basement, he, uh, he outlines two um, separate units, uh, units one and two, which would be 120 square feet for the bedroom, which comports with the town's requirements, um, and a very well laid out uh, bathroom, dining, living room area. Again, two units in the basement, two units on the first floor, two units on the second floor, so that's six units, and then one unit on the third floor. And so f um, for that one, it doesn't say in there, John, but what would be the square footage of that bedroom? Is that Does it still work out to be 120 square feet? Yeah, the minimum, I think, required by multifamily is 120, so there'll be 120. Right. Uh, that yeah. one's actually, you know, that's kind of like a bonus unit, so that one has some extra square footage, and I, I won't get the, mm -hmm. you can't add more bedrooms for septic reasons, but that will probably be a 200 square foot. And then there'll also be um, unheated uh, eave space, which will be storage. Yep. Someone wants it. And then, John, for my purposes, um, for, uh, first of all, congratulations. Um, as the lead agent that was working with you on the, uh, the sale and, and purchase, appreciate what you've gone through and, and what you're contemplating doing. Um, Selectman Howell had mentioned some phrases that we use all the time, those being affordable housing, capital A and H, lowercase a and H, workforce housing, things like that. And I know you've been clear to not identify. You're simply talking about housing for right now. Um, well, what would you imagine a, a bedroom unit of one of yours could fetch today in the open market? Well, what do you think people are looking at for rents for that type of unit, if you're willing, able, and yeah. so courageous to answer? Um, yeah, I don't care. Um, so I have some stuff, and so I know what people will pay. I actually don't charge what they could pay. Um, but you could easily get for one or two bedroom get two thousand dollars a month just because people are so desperate now Right. I'm trying to land this project in the sixteen to two thousand dollar range so that um, It's actually a uh, helpful, you know, because you could charge people almost whatever you want. People right. are so desperate um, So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to land in the sixteen to two thousand um, That's why the unit count matters um, But yeah, I, I have people that would pay, uh, you know, close to three thousand for something like, you know, just because they need something um, I have plenty I mean, it, it's scary what people will do to try to stay on Cape Cod. And if you look at what the kids are paying in Boston now for school housing, it's mm. stunning. Yeah. 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 Well, and for me, I, first of all, thank you for the answer. And that's, it's an encouraging response, quite yeah. frankly, because I think that is something that folks could consider to be reasonable. You know, and that's a word we haven't been able to use yet when we talk about housing options. Well, it, it's actually, you know, if you omit the uppercase A, lowercase A, uh, affordable, it is somewhat affordable. You can make a, a $16 a month payment and have right. a place to live nowadays. Right. And then for me, as a uh, described civilian, meaning I do not know a lot of what these uh, three gentlemen to my left and right know, 
Um, when I look at this, and I know you say that the town requires 14 spaces, and so for me, I say we've got seven bedrooms. So a bedroom could be um, presumably up to two people because you could have two people in one bed, correct? Yeah. You call Concept it, there. Yeah, call so it. even though it's a one bedroom, it may be one or two people that could avail themselves of these? Yeah. I, um, I yeah. certainly can't discriminate on who rents them. Yeah, the rooms qualify because they're 120 square feet. Thank you. Yep. Uh, meaning, when I hear one bedroom, I always think one bedroom, one person. Um, but to the earlier points, um, that may not constitute a traditional family. So these might be folks that are either looking for um, uh, later in life options, perhaps, or starting out in life options, if I could say it that way. Again, these are very yeah. uh, undefined words as far as law goes and <laughs> just trying to translate into plain English. Yeah, it, it could certainly be anyone, and I would even challenge you that I think times are changing. I don't think um, as many people are going to be homeowners as in the past, and I think this is some place you could stay for 20 years. You know, it's going to be well built. It's going to be a, a great location. I think the neighborhood's got a lot of potential, and uh, I, I think if you start providing year-round rentals where people don't feel like, oh, it's short, time, uh, short term, I need to buy a house someday, um, I, I think it's a solution for long term. Uh, yeah, I don't think it's. I think it could be anyone. You know, my parents could rent it if they wanted. There you go. So, John, I'd like to open it up for anyone that's uh, present here today, knowing that the general public hasn't had a chance to see the materials that you've provided. But we'll get there. But if anybody has any comments or questions for John, if you just want to come up to the podium and identify yourself, feel free to do so. We've got the paperwork here. All right, I was hoping somebody would take the bait. <laughs> Mary Anderson, I'll take the opportunity, John. I was going to chase you out in the hall and uh, congratulate you. I think this is fabulous. I'm one of uh, the selectmen, and anything I can do to help you, just holler. I appreciate that. I will. And if anybody wants to sneak a peek, Jenna, go right up. Again, just up to the microphone, please. So I'm going to put these down at the end in case anybody wants to sneak a peek while we're still here. Okay, I'm Janet Cardillo. In, in planning what, what we were doing, we found that if you had four bedrooms, it became a rooming house unless you lived in one of those bedrooms. I'm just wondering, would this be called a rooming house? And because that would go by different rules. Excellent question. Larry, for a potential uh, I, answer. I think I might be able to answer that. If, if my memory serves me correct, a rooming house is called an SRO, single room occupancy. That's what it's looked at. It's looked at as normally a place where you'd sleep, but you'd go downstairs and have your breakfast, lunch, and or supper. Sure. Okay. So All right. when, you, when you talk about a one bedroom, and, and correct me if, if you think I'm wrong, John, an SRO is some place where a bunch of guys or gals live and they eat in a communal place. That's not what he's what yeah. John's proposing. These have their own kitchens, bedrooms. Okay, that, that and, explains and it. Generally, an SRO comes under a, a single room occupancy comes under a special type of zoning that, to the best of my knowledge, Howard does not have. Okay. Right. Thank you. And John, these units. This will be a Thank rental building with seven units. Not going to be condoized, is it? No. Well, no, the one one ownership. One ownership. Seven rentals. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else from the general public? John, thank you very much, not only for the efforts, but the presentation. Yeah. Good luck. And um, I can certainly stay in touch with you if you want to work through any of the uh, programs and departments that we have. And um, keep plugging away. It sounds fantastic. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for the support. Um, Anything Brendan or I or, or, or Don can do, give us a show. Yeah, no, no, I, I, uh, I really appreciated the board selectman, you know, Kind of taking a chance on me, and uh, I, I plan to make them proud. So mm -hmm. we'll, we'll see what happens. You got two of them here. We hope see you do. The ribbon <laughs> we hope you do. See for the ribbon cutting in September. Your check cleared, so it was easy. <laughs> it did good. So I actually own it. <laughs> Thanks, John. Take care. Uh, last item under new business is for us to have a discussion and hopefully begin planning on community engagement outreach sessions uh, to begin in the fall of 2022 and. I've offered up some dates that um, I know work for, for me and also work against some of the other uh, events that are happening in town. 
Um, and so just wanted to put that out there so that uh, as we've talked before, um, I know we have James Gouldson under contract. Uh, we're still struggling for them to uh, have some availability to get here. But in addition to that, plus we have our um, twice weekly meeting, uh, Freudian slip, twice <laughs> weekly. You twice, want twice weekly? Twice <laughs> monthly meetings. Um, you know, I'm going to knock on uh, whatever this is and we'll my call God. it wood. Thank you. Um, to say that, you know, we're able to start engaging in more community fora in, in person, in public. Um, I know that I'm going to be conducting one on behalf of the Board of Selectmen uh, in October regarding traffic and safety in Harwichport. So the thought occurs to me that we can certainly get moving on these community outreach. And for me, one of the things I'd like to hear back from the general public is I'd have a roster of phrases such as capital A, capital H, affordable housing as we've talked about. And for me, that would be defined as how the federal government defines it and what the requirements are versus something like John Kerry may have just spoken about, lowercase a, affordable, meaning uh, something that doesn't impact upon our subsidized housing inventory, but certainly is a, an, a more affordable option that someone can avail themselves to, uh, to live in. Uh, within that, as Selectman Howell had mentioned it earlier, the concept of workforce housing, which is a great phrase that has very little, if any, legal bearing and then certainly doesn't impact on subsidized housing. And then in addition to that, uh, where and what type of uh, options should we pursue? Obviously, we have the major um, property available on Marceline. That would be part of the discussion. But more than that, an opportunity to re-engage the public saying, what's on your mind? So I'll open it up for trust members to react to and respond to and see if we can come up with some dates. Selectman Howell. Yeah, I'm glad you clarified that because I was looking at it and I was pondering just what was meant by the agenda item. There's two separate things that we need to be doing. One of them has to do with the Mars Line property specifically in terms of what the community would like to see that encompass. And that's one discussion. The other, for the set aside a date, however, for the other kind of community engagement, Golson has a very specific process and we went through portions of it already uh, with the, the committee what uh, two years ago a forum we had yeah we had two actually uh, it was a workshop and a forum uh, and I'd like them to get here I mean I know Jen because uh, I was in contact with her about a week or so ago she she unfortunately got COVID um, managed to avoid it the whole time that we were not doing anything and then got it just uh, 10 days ago. Uh, love to be able to hear from her about where she left off and what type of workshop she's looking to do next because the, the, plan, uh, the action plan that we're supposed to be working off of uh, counts some very specific uh, community attitudes and it, it pits different things against each other that are all in that bundle of affordable housing, but uh, they're, they're all different uses, like uh, rehabilitating older houses or uh, you know, having somebody develop something for us uh, as mixed-use housing or all affordable housing. But uh, again, I know we had some data because she did, some, she did a third thing, too. She went out and uh, talked to six legacy uh, people. I'm pretty sure she talked to Dick Gomes and a couple other people because we used to have a Harwich Community Development Corporation that built uh, where Gomes it's where Gomes Way is. That whole community that uh, that you go through to access it was built by the town uh, way back when uh, in the 80s. Uh, so she went and talked to legacy housing advocates. Then we had the workshops, uh, including the housing committee. Uh, with us in to me it would be contingent upon her availability because she's actually conducting the workshops uh, as part of the contract and she has a, like a, map, a road map about how to get us to where we need to be I mean she was one of the so my, my thinking what I took from our meetings over the last year was a desire from the trust to start getting out and engaging the community Goldson is, to me, is one thing set aside. I will share with everybody publicly that I'm incredibly disappointed with their lack of availability since we put them under contract. And as you know, it took them almost two months to respond to our request. So for me, it's, it's not just Goldson and the action plan. 
Um, I think for one, we owe the general public an event whereby they're invited to talk about the property on uh, the Marceline property on Pleasant Lake. I so for me, there's any number of four we could do. Yeah. But my understanding is that this was trying to comport with the trust's desire to start engaging the general public. I, I don't want to leave that impression right uh, there because I got an email last week that our, our legal counsel had not agreed to the insurance, so there was no signed contract until a week ago. Nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that the dates that we've offered haven't worked. Okay, but uh, again... The, the vendor needs to be available to come to the town to do the work. I got that, and I don't think that they were do thinking of that until they actually were under contract. But that having been said, I mean, maybe it's just me, but I'd like I'd like to be able to start talking about Marsline specifically because that that property is not going to wait, for, and it did not wait uh, for an action plan. We own it, and I know I've. Uh, the minutes that we just passed are probably rife with this, but I said this like for the last three and a half years, uh, that the only real measure of achievement for us is if somebody moves into a place that we built or that we, or, or under our aegis was put under rental uh, or purchase. Uh, we got the property. It's still going to take us quite some time to aggregate money and to get a developer and to come up, with, but we need a concept. And I'd love to hear what the community is looking to do. I know what I've pitched is what I'd like to see, but that's not ultimately my call uh, do we, to, to does make. Does the 27th work for the trust members? We've got a regular meeting on the 26th. This would be presumably an evening. From October or September? September. How would we advertise that to get people in? Because the, the other concern I have is that even in government, they, they, uh, they hold public hearings where the public doesn't show up. Uh, it, it, this is really important if we're going to have public engagement to have the public as part of it. Like even if it's only 15 or 20 people, just how how could we how can we be sure that with a two week lead time that we're going to fill a room? I, I, I agree with Don 100%. Um, so let me just to ask, what about October 4th? There's a well, reason why we've got dates there. Having said that, I, I would I would say that over the next week or two we over we could re this is what is today the 12th. Um, we can we could reach out and see if we get people to come on the 27th or the end of September. Let's get a little something going up there on the Marceline property because we're missing an awful lot of good opportunities. I guess what I'm saying is, what's our plan to get people in the room? I mean, uh, is Channel 18 it, or is it the newspaper? Or I'd say I, I'd say a combination of the newspaper, the Chamber of Commerce, and. Um, the Board of Selectmen can make the meeting. Uh, the Board of Selectmen seems to get um, pretty good coverage on what's going on. Uh, if you can make that meeting. Well, then you've got mm -hmm. town meeting. Why don't we use town meeting as a set? Town meeting is the 18th of October. That's yeah, why don't we use town meeting as one of the mechanisms and shoot for the November uh, date that you've got there so that we know that we've exhausted the possibilities of telling people that we're going to hold this forum, we'd like you to come. We could probably, we, I'd like to have one before the town meeting and then another one after the okay. town meeting. When's Even if only 20 meeting? people show up. Tuesday, that? October 18th. Well, yeah, limited sure. engagement, one night only. You hope. <laughs> <laughs> if I say it long enough. So how about next meeting, can we set what the agenda would be for that forum? Sure, absolutely. So like really spend like an hour on it and just come up with ideas and set something in motion? Do we want to do that tied to one of the open dates or separate? Tied to one of the open dates. Yeah. Yep. I, I'd say schedule a date and then see how we're going to make an agenda. The October date looks good, but like I said, like Brendan's saying, like we need to roll into the next meeting with, okay, Bring your where's the room? How do we get people into it? Uh, what are we going to talk about? Yeah, and you know the, the, you know, the critical thing, are we going to do it ourselves? Uh, are we going to hire somebody and just watch them do it? Pay them. To, there's, there's so many options. That sure. To, to get into my mind, my, my understanding is when my predecessor was uh, engaged in community engagement efforts, it was at least the town administrator there. Um, this is an effort of the trust. We would post it as a meeting, but every one of us should be there. For me, I like the idea of you know refining the things that we're looking for on the 26th, mm -hmm. and then we engage the audience with comment about what we think is available, what we're working on, and then just open the mic. You're talking I, like my, my expectation is that there, 
there's, um, I think, a keen desire by the public to be asked and to be heard. And, and I, I, if I'm hearing that right, so if we, if we game planned it out and, and had a presentation that we're looking at A, B, C, and D, and then we hear from the public that A and D are horrible and we look, we'll, you know, the, the, give us some direction on where we're going. I think Joe was right, though. You may just want to fact find and not give them A, B, C, and D. Just say, okay, what is it you're, you're most interested in and that we should be pursuing? Do we need 12 more Chloe's paths or maybe we want to cut down a little bit or something like that? Mm -hmm. I'm being facetious. I hope so. <laughs> Uh, and to find the affordable housing. And it's seven o'clock you're looking for, so we can get people that came, came out of work? Um, I didn't have a, a, an hour, but sure. I mean, the a day a, is probably a, a bad time idea. of day. Um, so we're contemplating our first community engagement outreach session to be Tuesday, October 4th, 7 p.m. Um, I can tell you that the usual suspects are um, the multi purpose room or something like that at the community center. I've been very keen lately on bringing people over to the former middle school at 204 Sisson Road in the library. That's a nicer um, locale. Say again? That's a nicer locale. But yeah, I mean, I, the community center is all purpose room is all well and good, but the acoustics are just miserable. So right I now. happened to reach out to a colleague of mine who was the director of cultural affairs, and she told me that that, op that building is open that evening, and she set aside the date. As, lu as luck would have it. <laughs> you don't think we could do it here? And even at that, we, should, we can Just probably go right back to originally we talked about making that building affordable housing. <coughs> Brandon, you were saying? Uh, this is too small for the venue. <coughs> yeah. um, I was curious. There's, uh, oh, there's a lot of competition for this room. Oh, gotcha. Um, sure. And again, having said that, we still might be up against uh, some unknown regulatory meeting, but right now, mm -hmm. these were the best nights as far as looking at the town's calendar. Sure. Why don't we look at seven in the uh, cultural center? Yeah. Gets people into the cultural former center. Middle school. Former middle school. Whatever the name is. Reason, thank you. Whatever the, um, the address is. <laughs> the 204. Um, and at then, that 204 building. Do we want to set aside, do we want to keep November 1st as a potential date yeah. uh, for Goldson to do um, the yeah. action plan? Yeah, yeah. All right. All right, and then we're going to use our September 26th meeting, which is our next regular scheduled meeting, uh, to develop, um, well, not agenda, but maybe just the process by which we want to roll out the next week. Does that sound right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Process, process, process and options. Yeah. Process, process and options. Yeah, options. Okay. And agenda. All right, then there is no other business to come before the trust. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? One, so moved. Just oop, a oop. point of clarification. Um, the 19th, we're having a dual meeting with the Board of Selectmen. And uh, no, I believe that is now scheduled for October 3rd. Okay. Um, I'm not available on the 19th. Okay. Oh, sorry, October 11th. Thank you. And we need to double. October 11th. We need to do, do a post because. Yes, yep. I'll make sure we have that on the 26th as well. Now I'll move. Thank you we, for the correction. Now I move that we adjourn. <laughs> it's been moved. Seconded. And seconded. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Jamie. Two more minutes. Two more minutes.